Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. I'm going to give it a few minutes to allow people to join in in the audience and kind of trickle in with us. For anybody that is currently trickling in, why don't you drop a message in the chat box below and let us know where you guys are attending from. I am attending from Los Angeles. It is not a great sunny day here, like one would assume, but it's a nice day out nonetheless. Todd, where are you joining in from today? I'm in Scotts Valley, California. Very nice. About five hours north of you. Nice. Chris, what about you? I'm assuming close to that? Yeah, Reno, Nevada. Oh, nice. Okay. Very nice. I'm from Sacramento originally, so kind of close. Actually, me too. I grew up in Sacramento, Carmichael, Fairfax. Oh, cool. So. Yeah, very nice. Very nice. Yeah, I was from Folsom. Very fun area. Yeah. Great. All right, so it seems like we've got a good amount of people that are coming in so we can get this started. Welcome today's, to today's webinar. I'm Ashley. I'm from Digital Niche Agency. I'm here with the Carno Compression team. We're excited to be putting together this live Q&A webinar for, for you today. Before we get started, though, I did want to remind everybody that there are questions in this webinar that we are unable to answer due to compliance reasons. Those questions are things pertaining to the company's financials, projections, or use of funds. For any of those questions, please feel free to reach out to the Carnot Compression team directly to get those answers for your questions. I'll drop the company raise page below for everyone to be able to access as well. Give me just a moment while I do that. So I'll drop that in the chat box. You guys can all visit their raise page directly and get more information on them as well. So that's in there for you. And then another reminder that this is a live Q&A. So we'll be answering questions at the end of the webinar once we go through the company presentation. There's a Q&A chat box down below. So please feel free to make sure to ask questions throughout the presentation. Um, and then once the presentation is concluded, we will go ahead and answer those. So without further ado, I will pass it off to Todd from the Carnot Compression team. Thank you, Ashley. Is the screen share working? It is. Okay. All right, well, uh, hello everyone. Thank you for taking uh, time out of your day to um, learn more about Carnot and um, what we're up to. Uh, so this is actually our first investor webinar. So um, our primary goals today are just to provide a company introduction. Um, we'll go around and um, introduce you to the team. And um, we'll talk a little bit about our technology and um, where we're headed. So um, we are developing a more commercially uh, or commercializing a more environmentally friendly air and gas compressor technology. And our mission is to lower the carbon footprint of industry by lowering energy consumption from air and gas compressors and doing so in an oil-free uh, process. So, oh, sorry. So again, the agenda here, uh, meet the team, uh, then we'll go through a company presentation and then we'll open it up for Q&A. But as Ashley said, uh, you can submit your questions as we go and uh, we'll take them all at the end. So, so first of all, um, my name is Todd Thompson. I'm the CEO and one of the co-founders of Carno Compression. I've got um, you know, 25 plus years of experience uh, coming up on 30. <laughs> um, um, background in finance, uh, corporate development, business development. Uh, I've done a lot of work with clean technology. I've been with other startups, uh, began my career in management consulting in New York City, worked with uh, Stuart and Stewart and Company, KPMG, PwC, and I spent 10 years at a large engineering and construction company in California. Uh, I'm a UVA grad. And uh, when I'm not working, um, I like to get outdoors and I'm usually either hiking or at um, one of my son's baseball tournaments. So Hans. Hans, you're on mute. Hi there. <laughs> Hi, I'm Hans. Uh, I'm the CEO of Carnot Compression. Uh, thank you for joining us today. We're looking forward to showing you a little about what we're doing. Um, I'm a co-founder of Carnot Compression as well. Uh, my duties are 
primarily coordination of shop and field activities, uh, 3D modeling and part design. Uh, I do a lot of the coordinating with suppliers and vendors, uh, most of the in-house machining and fabricating. Uh, I do a lot of the prototype construction and modification. So, you know, I, I do a lot of shop stuff. Um, I have a broad practical engineering background. Uh, I have an ag engineering degree from Cal Poly, and I've been a registered civil engineer for 25 years. Uh, I've over 25 years of experience in utility related civil design and construction. Uh, I've also worked in the wastewater treatment business as well as the brewing business. So I have lots of machining, uh, machine ability and, and, and systems experience. Um, I live in Nevada City, California, and uh, I like to get outside as well. We, we live in a place where I ride my bike a lot and disappear off into the forest as often as I can. Thanks, Hans. Chris, I'm oh, sorry. There we go. Not muted. All right, uh, Chris Finley. Uh, yeah, there it is. Uh, VP Engineering at Carnot. Uh, my background is I, I'm a mechanical engineer. Um, I have 20 plus years experience, probably 25 ish at this point. Um, and my background's in rotating machinery, but specifically in the oil and gas industry. Um, and, and even more specifically, um, liquefied natural gas. So pumps and turbines for the liquefied natural gas business. Um, I've worked in research and development roles, product and business development, um, also test engineering. Um, and let's see, so um, yeah, Ibarra International, I spent a lot of time at that company, um, which was an uh, equipment supplier in the oil and gas industry, relatively big. Um, UNR went to University of Nevada, Reno, um, is where I'm located right now, Reno, Nevada. And um, for fun, um, I do a lot of things, but mostly I would say probably um, playing music and um, cars. I'm a car guy, so it's called me Petrolhead. I'm working on cars, so that's about it. All right, thanks, Chris. Christophe. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Christophe Duchateau. I'm from France. I have a PhD in process engineering, about 15 years of experience. Uh, my thesis uh, was on uh, developing procedures to test uh, additives uh, for the oil and gas industry. After that, I went to Stanford for a postdoc. I worked there about three and a half years, uh, mostly on um, carbon capture and sequestration. Uh, I went through uh, Bechtel in Houston. Uh, I worked there uh, about a year. Uh, doing uh, computational fluid dynamics. And uh, I joined Carnot uh, in 2017, uh, where I'm doing uh, mostly simulations, uh, data analysis, and uh, report activities, these kind of things. And I'm located in uh, Reno, Nevada as well uh, and on my free time i really like to get outdoors and do some photography thank you christoph ifat hello this is uh Amy i'm a phd candidate at the university of nevada reno uh, my work over there is uh, building uh, creating a evaporator system uh, for which we can be, uh, which can be used in the cooling system, uh, uh, and we can uh, can be able to reduce a, a lot of uh, energy. And uh, when I see uh, kind of compression is kind of doing the same, uh, consuming the energy uh, that they're they're trying to uh, uh, have a wealthy uh, air compressor. And I uh, I uh, started uh, work with them in during during this summer. Uh, started work with, work with uh, current competition uh, during this summer, and uh, I'm 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 uh, like I, I'm 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 started. I, I joined uh, with current competition uh, as a intern, and I have uh, I have found this amazing team, and I'm uh, learning uh, learning a lot from this uh, this uh, amazing team, like uh, like every day, and uh, uh, I. I I like to do a lot of uh, outdoor activities like hiking. Uh, the most uh, most uh, most likable is uh, playing soccer, and uh, I I know everyone knows uh, about the soccer world cup going on, and I'm watching it like it's it's crazy. It's it's uh, and finally it would be on Sunday. So yeah, 
that's on me. Uh, and, yeah. Okay, thank you, Afat. We're happy to have you on board. Uh, so uh, that's the core team that's um, working on uh, the project or you know, day in, day out. Uh, we are also supported by uh, some active board members and some advisors. So a little bit more about the company and our background. Um, we formed the company in uh, 2014. Uh, and at that point, um, you know, this you know, isothermal compressor was really just a concept. It, it was an idea that um, we knew could work, um, but it was, it was very raw. So uh, we put in some personal money. Um, then we um, had some friends and family invest. And then from there, we've been mostly funded uh, through uh, grant funding. Uh, we've had uh, over $5.6 million of uh, non-dilutive grant funding. And non-dilutive means we didn't have to give up equity uh, for the dollars. So um, 3.6 million of those um, you know, grants have been awarded and the projects have been completed. Uh, we just got a $2 million award from the California Energy Commission, which is our second project with them. Uh, last uh, last spring, and uh, we've still got most of that money left to spend. So we've got a nice uh, paid for runway in terms of R and D uh, with the California Energy Commission. Um, we've done crowdfunding before, and we actually closed a seed round um, on Start Engine last April. Uh, wound up raising about nine hundred fifty thousand uh, dollars. We are beta testing our project. Our, our, our product. So, you know, in, in those nine or eight years plus, eight plus years, we've gone from, hey, this is a pretty cool idea that um, works to a commercial device that is in a dairy uh, operating. So, you know, we've now got a machine that looks and acts like a commercial product, although it's still in beta, so it's still not um, widely available in the market, and uh, we still got uh, some fine tuning to get it there. But um, you know, with this team and their dedication, we've um, we've come a long ways. Um, we've got a pretty broad IP portfolio, uh, five core patents, and those patents have been uh, many of those have issued both in the U.S. and in many of the large international jurisdictions. Uh, we've trademarked the Carnot compressor, and we've got uh, a lot of trade secrets from lessons learned over eight plus years of, of research and development. So why air compressors? And you know, why, why is this important? And you know, why should you invest in a company that is bringing a new air compressor to market? Well, uh, air compressors are everywhere. Um, they are commonly called the fourth utility. So after power, water, and gas, you've got air. You know, compressed air runs factories. Uh, it runs machine shops. It runs auto shops. It runs milking machines at dairies. Um, the list goes on and on. Uh, basically, I like to say anywhere something is made, there's an air compressor in the background. Uh, it's about a $40 billion market based on the third-party research uh, that we've been able to obtain. Uh, most of the market, uh, the compressors are oil flooded. So that means that during the compress compression process, uh, there's oil that mixes with the air as it's compressed. And that's for a variety of reasons, uh, most of it due to friction and heat. Um, the problem there is that um, that oil can carry over into the compressed air stream into the airline. And if that air is coming into contact with a product that might be consumed. So maybe food and beverage or uh, pharmaceutical, um, then that's a problem. So um, there's a lot of customers that cannot have any oil contamination in their products and they have to purchase oil-free compressors, which is about one third of the market. Uh, those compressors are much higher cost, less efficient, and they've got a shorter operating life compared to same sized oil flooded compressors. Um, so that's where we see a big opportunity and we'll get into it a little bit later, but our mission is to really have a lower cost, more reliable and longer operating life oil free compressor as compared to oil flooded compressors. Um, when we look at the lifetime cost of ownership, um, 
for heavy duty industrial users of compressors, uh, electricity is actually about three quarters of the lifetime operating cost. Uh, so when we talk about um, our technology, uh, due to the fact that it's isothermal, which uh, Chris will get into in a bit, uh, that gives us an opportunity to reduce energy consumption. Um, and we believe that for many applications, we can reduce the energy use by 20%, possibly more. Uh, so we've got a big opportunity here to have a product that uh, saves our customers money and then also does good for the environment by reducing energy consumption. So Chris, you want to talk a little bit about the technology? Sure. And I'm going to keep this relatively high level. Um, hopefully, if we want to dig, get down to the weeds, that um, can happen during the questions. But um, first of all, I just want to talk about where the idea came from, the technology came from. Um, and it's if you look at this picture on the screen right here, this is actually a patent, an image from a patent application from, I guess, yeah, the early but 1908, I believe. Anyway, so, um, you know, early 20th century, late 19th century. Um, and this is a, a compressor that was used for, you know, I'm not sure how many years, but Hans, you remember it? Anyway, it, it operated for maybe 70 years. Yeah. Give or take. 50 Sorry. plus, I think, and shut down yes. once for maintenance. Yeah. In a, um, so the way it works, and, and this was, um, um, an, an air isothermal compressor that was used to run mining equipment. Um, and basically the way it, it works is um, from this diagram, if you look on the, the upper left, um, this is, it was on a river. Um, so you have water flowing at a certain elevation and an underground cavern. So there's basically a, a hole drilled through from the base of the river into this cavern. Um, and in this case, about 300 feet, give or take. And as the water flowed, it would go down through this um, hole that was drilled. And as it went through, it would suck a certain uh, uh, amount of air with it. And because it would drop down 300 feet, you have um, the, just the hydrostatic pressure of the water um, being 300 feet deep. But what would happen is as it, the air bubbles were in the water, as it um, went down that 300 feet, that hydrostatic pressure would actually compress those gas air bubbles um, until it got down to the, the cavern below. And the water's heavier than the air, so the water would go down to the bottom of the cavern, and then the airspace on the top would then be compressed air. And then up towards, um, let's see, the sort the middle bottom, you see there's a, where the, the number is, let's see, 22 and 17, that's basically an air, a pipe that would go from the air part of that cavern up to the top, and um, that would be compressed air. Then the bottom of the cavern was in, uh, the water would then flow from there to a, a place slightly lower in the river and then go on. Um, so basically this is, was an air compressor that created over hundred PSI. Um, I don't remember the horsepower off the top of my head, but it was quite a lot mm -hmm. with zero moving parts. 5,000. 5,000 horsepower. Yeah. yeah. Um, and not only would it, did it do that, but it actually um, was isothermal. So um, when we, we talk about isothermal, Thermal. That means that the air is basically the same temperature after it's compressed as it was before it was compressed. So most compressors, when you when you compress air from say atmospheric pressure to higher pressure, it, it heats up. Um, but because we're doing that compression with water, and the water has a higher capacity to hold heat than air, all of the heat that's generated um, by compressing the air is absorbed into the water. Um, and then the water is constantly flowing through. So you always have a supply of cold water, um, which is basically cooling down the air as it's compressed. So when the air comes out, it's the same temperature it was coming in, um, which is very unique um, in the compression process, which is um, what gives us that potential um, benefit in efficiency. So um, our technology was based on this idea, but if you see, this is 300 feet high, um, which isn't very practical to put into an auto body shop. So um, by, and that 300 feet, to get that much pressure at 300 feet, it's because of gravity. So you have one G, right? So you have gravity, it's one G. Now the, the idea that we've had is by taking this one G system, if you rotate it, if you see by those red arrows, imagine 
do that line, that black arrow, imagine taking this whole thing and spinning it around. Um, well, by spinning it, you can increase the Gs. Um, for example, like if you're on the, was it the Gravitron? That <laughs> um, at the fairs, when you, you sit in it, it spins around, it feels like you're laying on your back and um, you feel those Gs pushing on you. Well, that's the same idea that we're using um, with our compressor. So we could take that 300 feet now and make it smaller and smaller by spinning this. So if we go to the next slide. So now we've taken this 300 foot um, compressor idea and by spinning it up in the you know, 3000, 4000 RPM range, we can now create the same amount of pressure um, with a, a spinning drum that's um, only about 14 inches in diameter. So we've gone from 300 feet to 14 inches. Um, and that gives us the ability to have the same benefits of the isothermal compression um, using water to compress the air, um, but in a much, much smaller package. Um, mm -hmm. So we're able to get that um, high efficiency um, isothermal. So the gas is still, or the air in this case is the same temperature it was coming out as it was coming in, um, but in a much smaller package. Um, so now all that energy for a typical compressor that would go into you know, heating up the heating up the air and then when the air cools it the volume goes down you have to run the compressor more we avoid all that so you know um as todd mentioned potentially we can um have this maybe use about 20 percent less um energy than any of the state-of-the-art compressors today mm -hmm. um and this image right here. Again, it's kind of high level and I'm, I'm hoping that we can get into questions for, with more details, but um, I'm not going to go through this in that much detail, but basically you have a, a water loop that is, um, yeah, let's see. It's hard with the, without my mouth. Yeah. Um, the water in this case, instead of being a river, um, in the other case where it's you know, you constantly have a supply of water coming into the river and then going down. Um, we have a closed system, um, which, so the water is constantly circulating through. Um, it um, compresses the air, goes through the center, and then is recovered um, through a pickup tube and then goes back through the top right there. And as the water cycles through, every time it goes down through the, this eductor piece that's the light green, um, it's ingesting a little bit more air. And then that air is compressed isothermally and then harvested through the shaft, which is the, the swarm. There you go. So the air is constantly coming in and going out as an open loop. The water system is a closed loop. And as because it's a closed loop um, and it's absorbing the heat of compression of the air, the water does begin to warm up. So we also have um, a couple options. We have um, different types of heat exchangers to cool the water off before it goes back into the system. Um, and that heat can be rejected to atmosphere like um, via a radiator or uh, potentially depending on the process it's installed, that warm water can be used um, in a plant to mm -hmm. as a source of energy for other equipment. Um, it could be a rank and cycle generator to generate electricity, for example, or um, if you had a, a room that needed to be heated it could be used in a radiant heat um, so the our byproduct um, of the compression is there is heat but it's warm water so that water can actually be used as an additional benefit somewhere else in the plant um, saving you know even more power over the long run um, and also because it, it is just water and air it's um, uh, by nature it's oil free so we don't have oil there's no need for oil um, and it's a very simple machine compared to some of the other compressor technologies. So, um, you know, we have basically one large moving part, you know, we don't have complicated, you know, pistons and crankshafts and, um, you know, multiple, multiple seals all over the place. It's a very simple machine, um, in terms of the number of parts. Now the design, of course, the, the hydraulics and the the design of the water in the air is very complicated on the back end, but the machine itself, once it's designed, is simple, reliable. One moving part, um, two very simple bearings, and one one seal, and that's it. Okay. 
Thank you, Chris. You're welcome. Okay, so what is our opportunity? Uh, well, I mentioned before the, the global air compressor market is about 40 billion uh, of annual revenue uh, and roughly 27 billion is oil flooded. So oil flooded rotary screw compressors, oil flooded piston compressors as, in, as examples. Uh, and 13 billion is oil free. Um, what's interesting is roughly 75% of the unit sales are 50 horsepower and under units. So um, in terms of unit count, um, where we've tested our technology is really right in the sweet spot in terms of um, how many units are sold uh, each year. Um, let's look at potential impact. Uh, in the US, um, we estimate uh, that approximately $12 billion of uh, energy cost is spent each year to drive air compressors. And you know, that's based on research that we've gotten from the Department of Energy. Um, so if we could replace every compressor in the US with ours, and if we reach our uh, energy savings potential, you know, that could be over $2 billion worth of annual customer savings per year just in energy alone. Uh, and then if you look at the global opportunity, you multiply that uh, times approximately six. So that leads us to our value proposition, uh, which is to lower that lifetime cost of ownership for our customers. And we're looking to do it in several ways. Uh, focusing on energy and maintenance cost, uh, as Chris said, uh, with one moving part, um, with less seals, uh, with just a couple of bearings, um, there are fewer failure points and maintenance points in our machine compared to other compressor technologies. Um, and also, uh, because of the fact that we're isothermal, we're not generating a lot of heat, uh, we don't have the frictional issues, we feel like we're going to have a much longer operating life machine as well. So we see multiple areas to drive savings through uh, less energy costs, lower maintenance costs, and a longer operating life. Um, and really that leads us to the mission is, you know, we feel we can offer an oil-free alternative for a lower lifetime cost compared to current oil flooded compressors. Uh, and that's pretty significant because when you look at the market price of let's say a 15 horsepower oil free compressor compared to a 15 horsepower oil flooded compressor, uh, that oil free compressor sells for about three times the cost of the oil flooded compressor. So we believe there's this big untapped market for oil flooded alternatives that exist um, that's not being met just because of the high upfront cost and the lower, um, lower lifetime um, you know, operating potential. We see, and you know, Hans can talk a little bit about this in the dairy industry, but um, we see customers that have oil-free compressors that have very short operating lives for the equipment when they're operated in heavy duty 24 seven applications. Uh, longer term, when we talk about scaling, uh, we've done some engineering work to suggest that the technology could scale up into a multiple hundred horsepower range. Uh, but, you know, we've got to walk before we run. Uh, initially, we're tar targeting that five to 25 horsepower market uh, where we've got uh, a beta test product right now that's within that range. So, Hans, you want to talk a little bit about what we're doing uh, in the dairy industry? Sure. Um, we, we have a beta unit in uh, a dairy up in Tillamook. Um, it's uh, been a bit of a rocky start with it, but it's a great, great spot to put it in. Uh, it, the, the compressors being augment two scroll compressors that are running two or three robots uh, in this dairy. So this, this entire dairy is um, basically only, only have two guys that, that watch, uh, I think, uh, close to 170 milking cows. Um, and they just pass through all day long, all night long, and these compressors just pound away and, and feed these systems. So right now, uh, that's all being done with scroll compressors, and there is very little love in the industry for scroll compressors because they break a lot uh, and they're expensive to replace. Um, so this is a really nice fit for us. Uh, we have a great opportunity. Um, we're working with a company called Dairy Specialists uh, up in Tillamook. Um, and they are associated with uh, Laley, I believe, in, in Sweden. Um, 
there's the, um, the milking robot is Lely and Dairy Lely, Special yeah. West, uh, is a distributor of the Lely equipment. And, and so there's 70,000 of these machines out um, out there. There's there's an opportunity to fill a niche right there that that is wide open. So that's really a great place for us to step in and you know have our first. Uh, um, our, our next opportunity is um, we're going to throw, throw the next slide up, please. There you go. Is is the uh, automotive painting uh, again? Oil free is a premium. Um, we have a shop in Gilroy, I believe, that mm -hmm. is in, in hosting one of our units for a while. Um, so there's there's two industries where there's a, a, a huge need um, for both oil free and efficiency, and and we have uh, an opportunity for both of those. So it's it's an exciting stepping stepping stone for us to get out into the world and you know that the opportunities just kind of proliferate from there. Thanks Hans. So that's a good segue in, into um, where we're headed next. And um, you know, we see a very near term path to getting customer traction in some early adopter markets, uh, both in dairy and in automotive painting. Um, so as Hans mentioned, we're working with dairy specialists. They are um, they have a large presence in the Western US based out of Colorado. Um, we've got another test unit that we will be deploying with them early in 2023. Uh, so that'll give us you know, two beta units for testing uh, within the dairy industry with dairy specialists. And um, the goal there is to put you know, a lot of operating hours under our belts, um, ring out the technology. Uh, and um, we are looking to form broader relation with dairy specialists and companies like dairy specialists to bring the technology to market. Uh, so, you know, the really interesting opportunity with, with them is that we've got a customer that uh, is also a channel partner uh, potentially for us. Um, so again, you know, the goal in dairy is, you know, really to optimize our compressor to run one milking machine. And then as we scale uh, to optimize it so that we would have a version that would run let's say two machines, three machines, really kind of align our air production with the needs uh, of the customer. Um, but that base um, specification can be applied to you know, numerous other applications, uh, automotive painting being one, but um, you know, all kinds of you know, machine shop, light uh, manufacturing activities. Um, you know, the workhorse compressors are those 15 to 25, 30 horsepower compressors in many of these shops. So that's what we see as being uh, the market that we will hit, um, hit hard and hit early. So that leads us to our commercialization path. Um, just at a very high level, 2023 is about field testing and field hours. Uh, two units currently uh, lined up in dairy. Uh, one unit funded by the Energy Commission um, in automotive painting. Uh, we've got a couple other test sites in the backlog uh, with our CEC grant, and we expect to expand our program in dairy as well. So, you know, our goal in 2023 is to get you know, thousands of operating hours under our belts with multiple, multiple machines and multiple environments uh, to really give us uh, a good indication of the requirements from the customer in real life situations. Uh, and that leads to 2024, where we'd be looking to do a soft launch. So within that five to 25 horsepower range, take, um, take a point, you know, be it a 10 or 15 horsepower unit and go and roll out a small manufacturing batch and then expand from there. And uh, this will be a transition into full production, which we see as very reasonable um, within the next three years uh, as we head into 2025. And then during that time, we're going to continue to do product development, continue to do R&D. And um, we believe that within this three-year time frame, we can have a design that would scale up to 50 horsepower. Uh, and then as we go, go to market, uh, we're looking to establish partnerships to help, help us on the channel side to um, not only be that customer touch point, but also to be that um, the service techs, eyes and ears on the ground as well for us. So that's really it in terms of uh, prepared material. So just to sum up, uh, we've got a patented technology, uh, strong IP position, 
Uh, we have a technology that we feel can have a very massive global impact. Um, we're in beta testing right now, so we're not in the market, but we're really close. Uh, we've closed the seed round. Uh, we've got a $2 million grant uh, that is mostly unspent, providing a runway for R&D. And uh, we're looking for additional investment. So again, thank you for your time. And uh, now I will open it up to questions. Fantastic. And then Todd, you can stop sharing your screen too, if you don't mind. Okay. Great. So thank you guys for that fantastic presentation. Tons and tons of information. As I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, there is a Q&A chat box down below. So please ask those questions that you might have. Uh, we do have a couple that came in during the presentation. So the first one is, what are the advantages of having so few moving parts? Okay, Hans, you or Chris, why don't you take that one? Uh, well, the, the first and foremost is there's fewer things to go wrong. Um, one of the great demons in, in machine design is, is complexity. Uh, the, the simpler we can make things, the, the less there is to go wrong. So um, by trying to keep it simple, we're trying to both save energy and, and reduce maintenance and increase life. Great. Thanks, Hans. How much of the product is off the shelf parts, motor, et cetera, and how much is custom machined? Um, boy, if I'd had to put a percentage on it, um, I don't know, 50%, uh, there's, there's, boy, I hate to hesitate here. Um, there are a few parts that are, that are, uh, large that we have custom made. The most of it, um, is aluminum and, uh, is fairly readily available, especially in bulk. Uh, we don't anticipate that there's any anything exotic or weird that we're going to have to uh, have made. Um, a lot of the balance of plant stuff, valving, plumbing, wiring, controls, cabinet, all of that is off the shelf. Um, so largely what you saw in that cross section that Chris showed earlier, those are the things that we we will wind up making. And please explain the HP rating. So basically that relates to the size of the drive motor uh, that's running our compressor. Perfect. What problems were encountered with your beta site and how easily were they overcome? Rotary seals right now are our, kind of our demon. Uh, we've been struggling with um, the design that we've been using, uh, it worked really well in our test bed and we took it out in the field and um, it didn't work very well. Um, so we've been back and forth several times trying to get that repaired. Everything else seems to be running really well. Um, we do have a revised design on that um, and it, we're it just about to enter into testing on that. Um, we think it'll fix the problem. Um, so that's really kind of been the biggest issue. Um, Probably the other issue is just keeping spray to a minimum. This does move a lot of water and we do get some get some misting off of it. Um, so we've got several different ways of, of mitigating that. And as we get better with the hydraulics, that should disappear completely. Yeah, and I would just maybe add to that, um, you know, just kind of all the, the usual issues that come up with uh, a first of a kind um, beta test unit. So, you know, we've had a lot of lessons learned just in terms of how we fabricated uh, certain components, how they've been put together um, that, um, you know, we're applying to the next one and, you know, that'll be applied to the production units. So again, you know, the more, more units we get in the field, uh, the more hours that we get under different conditions, um, the more we're gonna be able to shake, the, shake this out and have it to a point where by the time we're ready to go to production, uh, in mass, then, um, you know, we'll have a high level of confidence that it's going to be a long operating life product. Great. Do you have any plans or I'm sorry, do you plan to have your own machine shop of send out for fabrication? 
Oh, do you want that? Yeah, I'll take that one. So um, right now we've been operating in what I would call a very capital light mode. So, you know, we've been working with local machine shops and suppliers um, and really been focusing on doing the assembly work ourselves. Um, so how we go to market as we get through next year, um, it'll probably be most of the same as we're doing, you know, half a dozen units for beta testing, let's say. Um, once we get into uh, production mode, uh, there's likely some of those items that we'll bring in-house and um, some where we will form relationships with third-party suppliers uh, to do that work. Um, but we're trying to stay as flexible as we can. And right now we're trying to keep, um, you know, do this um, in the most uh, capital-friendly way as we can. And what makes Carno stand out amongst your competitors? Well, I, you know, it's pretty simple. It's the technology. You know, we've got um, a totally different mousetrap than our competitors. Um, so, and we've got it protected with strong IP. So um, nobody else in the market has a compressor that has one moving part for the compression process that compresses isothermally. Um, so um, we can deliver a lot of advantages to our customer, which we outline our customers, which we outlined in this presentation. And um, we believe we can do it in a very efficient manner um, as we get into the marketplace. So it's really, you know, we've got a completely different technology than anyone else. And um, we're selling that technology into a marketplace where, you know, the customers, they just want a reliable source of compressed air. They don't care if it's, you know, what kind of compressor it is. Uh, they just want it to work. And, you know, they don't want it to be a problem. They don't want it to go down. Um, and, you know, they don't want to have to pay for a new one every three or four years. So, um, we believe we can check a lot of those boxes and come into the marketplace with something that's going to be radically different than um, anything they've seen before. Great. Is your system compatible with compressing carbon dioxide to 1200 PSI? Possibly, but not anytime soon. <laughs> Is this considered a single stage? Yes. Um, Hans, how much have we, what kind of pressure have we generated in one stage? Uh, I think the best we've done is 200. Um, we haven't tried to build this into a multi-stage process at this point. We've talked about it, um, but truthfully, the the challenge of just getting to through this this first stage has been an, enough of a, a bite that it's kept us busy. But we, we do talk about it. Um, mm -hmm. There are opportunities there. There are also opportunities for other fluids, other liquids and gases, uh, as previous question asked, but they invite lots of different complexities. And, and, and like I say, the, just the air and water uh, combination has been enough of a bite. Well, and the air compressor market is enough of an opportunity as well that you know there's no reason to uh, get too far afield. Um, you know, we've got a big first market opportunity right now. So, you know, that's what we're chasing. And then this is kind of a two part question, I believe. So what is the output and pressure and volume per horsepower? So I'll start with that one question. Chris, you want to take that one? Um, so yeah, one more time. It, yeah, no problem. The, what is the what is the output and pressure and volume per horsepower? And pressure and volume. Um, I, it's hard to. <laughs> there, there's like three variables right there. So um, I, I, I guess for I, I could take a an individual um, point just to give you an idea. Um, you know, uh, but that is kind of a that is a range and not a specific point. So. Um, right now, I think the the machine up in Tilla Bay is about 120 psi. Mm -hmm. um, the airflow it depends, you know, um, between maybe two and 
seen up to five uh, CFM and on a 10 horsepower um, motor. Um, but right now uh, with the, the, the new seals and the other, another component that we're adding, we're hoping that, that um, here within the next few weeks, um, we should be able to increase that by hopefully double the flow. Hopefully, you know, ideally we're around 10 to 12 um, CFM at 120 PSI with a 10 horsepower motor. And what is the output temperature of the cooling cycle? Um, I think right now we're running this particular application, we're running it's about 120 to 125 degrees F. Um, but that is, that's um, set by, by us. That's, it's set by the, the cooling capacity. Um, if the system was to run longer, or if it was um, controlled a different way, you could, that temperature could be higher or lower, um, depending on the either the requirements of if there was a use for that um, water, the warm water, we can actually have it a little bit warmer. Um, if there is a need for the air to be cooler, then we could um, actually have that water less. But long story short, the current application up at the Tiller Bay unit is about 120 to 120 degrees F. And a typical compressors put now at 120 PSI is like 350 F, mm -hmm. somewhere in that range, mm -hmm. just to kind of give you some scale. Right, and you know, what I would add to that, and again, you know, we're, we're in beta testing. Uh, so, you know, our specifications are, you know, our output's not where it needs to be, um, you know, for the commercial marketplace um, quite yet. And, you know, I just wanna be very clear about that. Uh, but at the same time, um, we are very close to having a set of specifications that will meet the customer's requirements for dairy. Uh, so once we get into that double digit CFM range, uh, we're already generating the pressure that we need. Um, and we just need to get the output flow up uh, a little bit and we will have a machine that can run a milking robot uh, 24 seven. Uh, so, you know, that, um, that next step is, is within our sites here. Um, and then, um, you know, we're just scratching the surface on where we can go in terms of efficiency with, with the technology. So, um, you know, we've got another um, webinar on the books in January, which we'll talk a little bit more about, you know, kind of our plans for doing that. Um, you know, we've been working with um, Monroe and Associates on um, lean design. So um, we've got a lot of, uh, and we've been through um, a couple of workshops with them and I got a lot of great ideas in terms of um, making the design even simpler, um, lowering the bomb, lowering the cost. And um, we're also engaged with uh, Oak Ridge National Laboratory uh, in a DOE funded project. So I didn't even <clears throat> talk about in the presentation that you know, um, you know, DOE has provided um, grant funding as well in the, forms, in the form of a project uh, where Oak Ridge National Laboratory is doing research on our behalf. Um, and the sole purpose of that project is um, to optimize the design of uh, the shapes of you know, kind of that fluid flow path that Chris walked through. Um, and so there's still a, a lot of opportunity to uh, see some significant step up in, in airflow, we believe, um, over the next um, several months here. And we've got um, pretty defined path in terms of how we're gonna go about, uh, about doing that. Most compressor systems are quite old. You know, they've been around for a century, most of them. Um, and, and, you know, they've had literally millions of, of man hours worth of time and energy trying to refine the, the improvements and the efficiencies on them. This is a brand new thing. This is a, mm -hmm. this is a, a, a flagpole out in the middle of a great wide open field. And so we're still in a, in a the stage where we're going to see large leaps in efficiency. We're not going to it's not going to be one and 2%. We're going to be doing five and 10 and 15% for a while here. And then it'll, as it gets refined over time, those, those, those gains will, will narrow some, but um, you know, literally everything about this machine is new and literally everything about this machine can be improved over time with, with enough energy into it. Yeah. We're still in the first or second inning here. 
And the third part of that question uh, does ask about financials and cost structures. So for those questions, we're unable to answer those on the webinar just due to compliance reasons. So I'm going to go ahead. I linked it at the beginning, but if you hopped in late, I'm going to link it in the chat box again for everybody for the Carno raise page. Please feel free to visit that raise page, learn more about their team. And that's where you guys can ask those financial questions, any projections for the future, all of that stuff. For the next question, does the compressed air have high humidity? And is that an issue if it does? No, actually, uh, well, it's it, it, that's a two part question. It, it's got 100% humidity, but it's leaving at a lower temperature. So there's less water in it um, in, in a comparative sense. So if you were to fill a tank to 120 PSI with air at 350F that was saturated, you'd wind with a puddle of water at the bottom that's fairly substantial. If you do that with air that's 120 degrees, there's a lot less water in the bottom of the tank because the, there's a lot less water holding capacity in the air because it's less less warm. Um, so the, the answer to your question is it, it, it will have less condensate appearing downstream. Uh, and so it creates less issues on tooling and machines downstream. And the lower load on any drying requirements as well. When you discuss one milking machine, does this mean milking all 170 milk cows? <laughs> That's a dairy question. Uh, my understanding is, no, they have three machines that are running and they run 24 seven and those machines handle that 170 cows. Um, it, it's really uh, it, it been a lot of fun to watch. I've never been around one before, but um, it's just like a bunch of people getting in line for a latte. They just kind of line up behind the, the robot and go through at a time and get a snack when they do it. it it's uh, kind of an amusing thing to watch. And then another one about the competition, just asking, is there much competition? Okay, so I'll take take that. Um, yeah, the, the air compressor market is, uh, it's a very mature market. Um, it's, you know, without getting too much into um, kind of consultant speak, but it's what we would call a fragmented market. So there's a lot of players. Uh, there's some players that have some pretty significant market share. Uh, but there's a lot of players in the industry. And, you know, we, we see that as an opportunity because, you know, it's by and large the same machine. Um, you know, it's a different color and, you know, it's a different manufacturer's name on it. Um, and, you know, it's essentially, you know, compressor is a fourth utility, it's a commodity. So if we can bring a lower cost commodity to the marketplace, then we're going to have a significant advantage over all of the competition. Um, and so, you know, that mature ecosystem uh, could be a great opportunity for us. Um, you know, as we go to market, uh, there could be ways to um, work with some of those major players to really expand our reach into the marketplace as well. Great. We do have a couple more questions and we do have a couple more minutes left. So just one last reminder that if you guys have any questions for anybody in the audience, now is the time to ask those before we wrap up the webinar. We have another one that is, what are your plans for an exit IPO, M&A, et cetera? Okay, I'm not sure how much detail we can get into that for uh, compliance reasons. Um, you know, right now our focus is on um, bringing the product to market and bringing a very compelling product to market. Um, and, you know, if we can focus on that, I, I think the, um, the exit opportunities should uh, take care of themselves. Um, you know, as you've seen, it's a pretty experienced management team. So uh, at some point, uh, you know, we're gonna want an exit for ourselves. So I'll just leave it at that. Perfect. Say more about the reduction in shutdowns due to compressor breakdown. What are the dairy folks saying? Tom, do you want to take that or? Um, we sure. Both take it. Well, we can both take it. I, I, there's just a lot of complaints about the scrolls. I, the, the tips burn up on them. Um, they just, they're expensive. They last a couple of years. I think they're, I don't know, like $5,000 for a scroll and $15,000 for the whole compressor and they get, swapped out a lot mm -hmm. um they don't they can run I, I believe like 20 hours a day and that's about the best they can do um 
one of the advantages of what we're working on here is we can just run. Uh, it doesn't, we don't have to shut down. We don't get too hot. We just run. So that's, that's a very appealing thing to uh, an operation that's got a 24 seven need mm -hmm. you know, for, for compressed air. Um, you're not cycling as much, you know, starting and stopping, which is where a lot of the breakdown stuff occurs. Um, so that's an advantage that we have. Uh, I, in general, um, I, it, the the lifespan of the compressors that are in the dairy industry are are not something that they're happy with and, mm -hmm. and they just keep literally begging us guys get get there please because <laughs> they want this um they they, they want to see something different than what they have yeah i mean if you're, if you're a dairy farmer and you know you've made this big investment in milking robots to automate your your dairy um you know it reduces labor costs it makes a farmer's life um you know, much, much easier. Uh, not that it's an easy life, um, even with the robots, but it, you know, it, it does um, lower the burden on, on the farmer. Um, but, you know, if you're spending $15,000 on a new compressor every 18 months, uh, and then you're, you're down and you've got to have redundancy, it just creates a lot of problems. So, you know, um, nobody, um, you know, a compressor is a tool that you know, people don't want to think about it. They just want it to run and to work, right? So, you know, we believe that's something that, um, you know, we can bring to the market and, and you know, it'll run and it'll work um, out of sight, out of mind. Great. <clears throat> and then what was your 950K seed round like? Did you do it as crowdfunding and hundreds of investors or was it a private placement with a small number of investors? So that seed funding round was on Start Engine. So we had roughly 1,100 investors in that round. Um, prior to that, um, there had been some private placements with, you know, the founders, family and friends. Uh, but the bulk of the money has been through, um, and actually that's not an insignificant number. Um, you know, that number's up into the, you know, I want to say, Six hundred thousand dollars or so is was collectively invested by uh, by the team, uh, family, and friends before we went out and, and raised some money on Start Engine. So, uh, in addition to um, you know our time, which has been quite significant here, um, you know a lot of us have written um, some sizable checks as well. And then we've got time for probably about one more question. And it is, do you have any beta units currently in the auto paint industry? And if not, when, which I believe we kind of went over in the sideshow, but. Yeah, so actually, if you go to our raise page um, or, or the videos on our website as well, and, and you look at and you go through the video, you'll see a segment from Nick Springer, who is uh, owns a set of auto body shops in, in the Bay Area. And um, our first test in the industry is actually at Nick's shop in Gilroy, California. And uh, the, um, that's being funded through the California Energy Commission. So uh, that's uh, happening um, in the first half of next year. Our, our, next, our next machine is gonna be at another dairy in, or in uh, Colorado. So we'll have two in the dairy industry and then the third one will be at the auto body shop in, uh, in Gilroy. And we did get one final one. That's a great one to conclude on. Can I please watch a recording of this conversation and presentation? Jumped in a little late. Absolutely. So for anybody that might have jumped in a little bit late, maybe you had to hop a little early, not a problem. We are turning this into a webinar recap. This will be going out next week for you guys to be able to rewatch. So I have that link to the Start Engine page for Car Carno's team in the chat box below. You guys can visit there. There's a little button at the top, a little heart, and you can like the page. It will allow you to get notifications and emails anytime we put out any information for the team. So that webinar recap will be on their Start Engine Raise page next week. Um, and yeah, we are very excited about this opportunity. I hope you guys all enjoyed the presentation. And thank you to everybody that joined and attended. And thank you to the Carno team for coming and giving such a great presentation. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate everyone's time. Thanks for the thoughtful questions as well. Yeah. All right, you guys, everyone have a great rest of your day and a great holiday. Thanks.